block in RRH. It has to happen in the cloud, but cloud how you will be doing jointly the channel estimation one is wireless, another is uh, optical. I do not know any such channel estimation technique is really existing who can do these two different kinds of channel estimation at a time sitting at a place. And you have to do that justice because downlink also will be happening after processing signal will come back to RRH, RRH will then uh, transfer. So, you have to estimate these three channels jointly sitting somewhere, then then the, after coming back the downlink transmission will happen. Okay? If I try to do the code book design, same problem for me. I have to understand the three channels, do the code book design in such a way, such that actually the beam, beam forming can be done. And remember for your 5G to go ahead with the improved user connectivity and improved quality of service, you have to do some kind of coordination. We call it that comp, that classic comp now actually is having very great meaning that you now you coordinate about the multiple way station or the RRHs, let them do the joint beam forming to improve the quality of service at the, so the problem of the end users will be gone, problem of your uh, improving CSI that will be gone. Yeah, you can improve the SNR quality and your channel conditions, different channel conditions, different speed, all the problems can be nicely handled. Basic question, who will be doing channel estimation for me and design of the precoder? Some signal processing guy once again, you have to do it. Understand the problem statement and do it. Then the technology can come into picture. This is not a very big dream. Tomorrow you will be seeing all the city electric poles, they will be transferred as a smart pole, correct? I am putting a electric bulb there, right? The poles are really high. People are telling they will be also holding the APs, 60 gigahertz APs, fine? Your streets are well planned, correct? The buildings are static, you know very well how the reflection will happen, great? So what is the big deal? Why can't you do the proper beam forming? Such that the, with, even with actually the densification of the cars that are going out, why can't we do a, go ahead with the 60 gigahertz based very high data rate communication over the streets? It should be done. At least AP to AP talk, that direct pencil beam forming is just very easy to do. You know the exact distance between two poles. You know where the APs are located. Very highly you can direct the beams towards that. So it is a hopping wise actually the very nice network can be formed. So very odd thing is the people from the electrical departments who are coming up with these electric vehicles, the <laughs> renewable energy uh, research, they have come up with their proposal let us change all the smart poles, let us come up with the smart poles where all the electric poles will be acting as a communication device, okay? I was surprised to see it because it never came from my mind. So they are the managers of the electric power, they are told we can jointly optimize the power of this communication as well as the power requirement for lightning in my street. Morning I will harvest it, the solar panels wise I will do that. And then I will actually utilize the same thing for the joint transmission as well as my lightning of the power. Excellent it is if it can happen. Uh, so this is the 5G uh, cellular and backhaul we understood now. So I am not spending much time here. A very simple calculation we will show here. If you have an omnidirectional antenna for your high frequency like 28, 30 or 60 going above, you have an extra path loss of 20 to 40 dB. Nobody can stop it. It's a fundamental of communication. You write the freeze equation, it will happen. Forget about your downline of sight. So obvious question is beamforming is a mandatory stuff here. I wrote this line here because apart from the beamforming, few more term things you have to understand. When we are in the narrowband communication, there was not an additional losses because of the different molecules. See, it is a fundamental class scale physics. You increase the frequency, of an electromagnetic wave, the property of the particles keeps on changing. You need to understand at what frequency, how the reflection coefficient, dispersion, diffraction changes, okay? And which molecule becomes more damaging for which frequency? For example, 28 gigahertz, somebody, some molecular absorption is, will be happening. 60 gigahertz, 
some other molecule for example oxygen will be creating and damaging your stuff go to 100 gigahertz moisture which will eat up your energy so everywhere each and everybody is not creating problem somebody some, some frequency is the dominating factor to create a problematic light so the propagation we cannot do anything but processing we can do definitely different way and as the losses are different so the if even if we are de designing some uh, receiver transceiver that is expected to work say suppose 20 to at least 60 so that receiver should understand that the absorption is not happening same way same signal transferred over the same bandwidth over two different frequency will uh, experience two different amount of the losses so the signal processing technique can never be same you have to compensate the extra losses that are happening challenges if you are in a line of sight for high frequency remember your signal is highly focused if there is a blockage you are lost so we cannot trust only on the line of sight communication for high frequency non line of sight communication has to happen there should be a probability of the blockage calculation always in the mind of the signal processing people depending upon the environment if it is a static environment whatever the speed of the people are based on that the probability of blockage will come if you are in the outdoor the probability of blockage will be mainly governed by the speed of the vehicles on the road for your uh, high speed vehicles it is again the another profile for the blockage probability that is the fundamental thing channel characteristics will be dynamic if you are on a non line of sight not only the beam forming is a problem somehow i can actually do and do the beam forming but at the main problem starts after that whenever channel is changing location of your transmitter receiver changing some blockage is coming and going out that is the dynamic nature every moment wise you have to sense and then do the correction according to it we call it actually the beam tracking after training it is the tracking and the maintenance of it and giving a proper call whether i will go back to do the beam forming once again or no i do not need because beam forming always is a time taken process it will hinder your spectral efficiency so always target should be to reduce the beam forming repeated beam forming tracking is the major thing that you have to do always to stop the beam forming once the network is established and the connection is on so clustered multipath model this is any interesting thing i will show you how the channel behaves in this high frequency hardware limitation impairments all are there antenna attributes interference management as usual these are the basic challenges of the millimeter wave channel design what has happened here you know see earlier also we were transmitting suppose here if i open up a uh, wi-fi transmitter he will transmit whenever he is transmitting so signals are going and hitting any different parts of this uh, room and coming back to your receiver we know it all so as it is hitting different location different scatterers so the multipaths are coming getting joined actually when any electromagnetic wave has hit your typical surface reflection has been done by each and every particle of the surface wherever that ray has gone see it is a ray right the way i have shown you we are really what thinking i am releasing one point ray basically when he is progressing it is like this it is actually increased the weight so whenever he has hit it so it is certain area it's a finite area over which the reflection has happened it can never happen that it has been reflected from a point then what happened all those points if we have received why the wi-fi receiver is not seeing it is the question we could not see it so our life was easy we could not design it in the signal processing now remember if i give you a 10 gigahertz bandwidth your time duration in the of the signal comes in the 1 by 10 gigahertz right already down in the picoseconds level almost that is the resolution of the receiver now i should be able to tell zooming capacity of the receiver has tremendously increased whatever we could not see from the channel now i am able to see is it clear if i am able to see so the channel estimation lot of thing i can do 
So question is your receiver can see, earlier receiver was not able to see, that is why your uh, Rayleigh distribution came into picture, how you know? It is a law of large numbers we put on the incoming signal because we could not see all of them, multiple users. Thousands of the multipass were coming, we could not see it. We put a very easy assumption on the mathematical framework that by law of large numbers, it will be on the same beam, all each and everybody will be representing a single multipath. And that is why the Rayleigh distribution nicely came into picture and we were safe, we have done our receiver design, things are working. We apply the same theory here, it will not work. Because every multipath is different, every multipath has been reflected with a different angle of departure, angle of receive. You can never handle them with the same angle of receive. It is a major mistake if you try to do that and your bitter rate 100% sure it will be flat in the uh, your file layer itself. Okay? And going by that, now see how the channel has changed. I am coming. That is a DOA estimation standing in the front end receivers. What you are going to do? See front end of the receiver whenever I have received something, I should do not only the identification of the uh, amplitude of these guys, amplitude of the multipass. That is the way traditional channel estimate people do. We estimate the gain. We never estimate the angles. We estimate the gain and what delay it is coming. We have to now estimate the angle, the gain, the delay and the angle. See how the pulse are coming. So you consider any one of this, this green one, this is a cluster. This cluster of ray, if it came from one scatterers, never all the rays came exactly at the same way. If you zoom in, you will see that every multipaths have come with different delay and there is an angular description. They are having an angular spread in it. So if you see, there was a uh, decay. The decay, is, there is a major decay happening. This blue line is saying the way every cluster is having one line of sight, not line of sight, the biggest power path. But that biggest power path amplitude is also coming down. But if you zoom in, inside the cluster also the decay is happening. So capture everything, use it efficient way, then you will be able to capture the maximum energy from the channel. Otherwise you are lost. Right? What beamforming does now? Beamforming puts the spatial filter based on this understanding. If I understand my location of the receiver is towards a direction where this, uh, suppose these pink clusters are standing, I will always focus my beam towards the line of sight and all those non-line of sight paths oriented. My special spatial filter design should be in that direction only. I will never put anything, any energy I will release towards this uh, yellow or this green wise. You may ask me why this green is actually having a high power. My, look, my user is not that direction itself, why should I do? Even I know the channel that side is good, my uh, receiver is not in that direction. So I will not do. Okay? Now the question is coming, whether the channel is good, whether we will put the energy that day or not. No. Wherever my location, locator is, wherever my receiver is, in that direction, wherever the maximum stuff is there, I will put the filter that direction. Currently, uh, till we are not doing every day, yes. But frankly speaking, your uplink and downlink should be done separately. See, the beauty of this whole wireless communication is what you know. The guys who are the, who understand the channel the most know, they win this area. Very recently, one paper has come out to propose a completely new modulation scheme, okay, which can give you a very nice performance over your OFDM, okay? And it is handling with a very high speed because the people who were, they are continuously thinking how to give the modulation for this very high vehicular speeds. That was the motivation. So, but they could show us. And who gave, wrote that paper? It was a mathematician who wrote that paper. How we did that? He understood the channel matrix. is a pure linear algebra. He changed the construction of the matrix and the new modulation scheme came up. Professor Hedy has come up with this. So it is not about actually whether you are a wireless communication guy or a signal processing guy. 
whether you are having a very good sense of the uh, things, channel that is around, happening around the, surrounding you. If you know it, yes, you can do it. That's the beauty. I will show you the configurations. <laughs> so, channel model in that sense was a very big task for us. And if you see slowly the way people have attacked the channel modeling for wireless communication. Worldwide you see the, all the research papers. There are fundamental two, three ways the way the channel modeling we could do. One is actually the correlation based flat channel, flat flooding. Then we came slowly with the wideband. First time when wideband came, remember 2002 FCC released us the ultra wideband, okay? First time very wideband was released. And sitting in, actually my uh, Samsung hired me that time because I was doing <laughs> research in ultra wideband that time. So that time what happened, first time people released in the history of communication a wideband. We had no idea actually how to, uh, what to do with the wideband. We were uh, shouting. We are cannot hike the data rate because we don't have the bandwidth. Suddenly when FCC released, worldwide people could not give the solution what to do with the 7 gigahertz bandwidth. They, what they did from the TI the solution what we can and even actually we have done setting in the Samsung. The whole technology that we have divided is that, okay, we will do the multiple banding and small, small banding with the 500 megahertz, we will try to do the signal processing. That's the way we managed ourselves. But see actually that we made ourselves full we could not utilize the bandwidth in an e efficient way. That time also we understood that there is a delay and there is an angle, but we never looked into whether there is a spread. But first time when channel modeling was going on, at least Professor Saleh showed us that look, this, hap this is happening, some spread flood cluster wise happening. So the communication now, the electromagnetic waves are propagating through the media, not as a single, single multipath. There is a spread against every multipath is happening, realize it. So that's why, but that spread he showed on the delay domain. So clusters were coming, overlapping clusters were also coming, but everything was spread over the delay domain. That time also we didn't do the dig research to see whether there is something on the angle domain, okay? And ultra wideband was also died. I guess actually if people would have, the technology would have actually stayed for a few more years. By that time itself, we would have realized, look, something is happening on the angular domain also. So change the theory, change the approach. That we didn't do. Slowly when we modified it, and now we are in the extended SV model, people tried to understand, okay, look. So spread if it is happening, so we will do the modeling Direction of arrival and direction of your departure, both needs to be looked to see the channel. At what direction your signal is uh, released, at what direction you are receiving. This is a dual beamformed channel kind of, that's the beauty. So if the receiver and transmitter is having the capacity of beamforming, suppose both are capable of, so then the channel will be completely dedicated and uniquely customized for them kind of. So they are not looking the whole universe. They're really seeing the effect of that typical stuff. So you have to consider the direction of departure as well as the direction of arrival. We called it the dual directional channel model with a spread over only the delay domain, fine? Then also we need, didn't realize something is there on the space. The concept of space came when the stochastic model and the support of the beamforming slowly came up in the view of the millimeter wave communications. Now people are also talking about the 3D time variant model for this AY people have come up with. This uh, 3D model is talking about something like this. Apart from this spread, you have the antenna sitting. Remember, this spread happened because of the property of the channel. Now you are having a smart antennas. If your antenna is having the polarization, either how horizontally polarized or vertically polarized. So channel has fourth dimension. It is a polarized beamformed channel. Got it? Now the whole 3D channel model is in the picture. Time, delay. So I'm, I should say the gain, delay, spread over space, and then 3D wise in which domain you are. It is a horizontal release or it is a vertical release. 
So anything can be, if your receiver is vertically fitted, why I should release my energy in the horizontal direction? I will release the whole energy over the polarization also. Done, right? This was a one example, the way actually this uh, 60 gigahertz uh, channel modeling was done for a small area. This is uh, from IEEE 02.11 uh, AD, uh, that campaign that they did. I wrote here just because to show that this is, that was a uh, reflection, your uh, ray reflection model, they did the experiment. They took only the three rays. First is the line of sight coming, one reflection from the ceiling came, one reflection suppose from the ground plane came. One good part is that, they showed that as it is a reflection based, after second reflection, third reflection, up to that you can go. Beyond that, no, there is no meaning. Power diminishes such a uh, big way that actually you can go ahead with your receiver design considering three reflection. But it varies from the indoor to outdoor, definitely. But in that sense, another actually information came. Millimeter wave channel is sparse. You will never get the dense multipath like the Rayleigh channel for the narrow band, okay? Just because power gets absorbed so fast that after the second reflection or third reflection, there is nothing left. Means power already got absorbed when the first reflection happened. Second reflection, second time power absorption happening. Third time after that, whatever the power you are getting, chill is not. As it is a sparse channel, I can do a lot again. I mean, this sparsity will help me to do the special filtering again. See, I can do the frequency reuse, understanding the fact my channel is also helping me to do that. Okay? Interference management, so easy now, if we can do. We keep on shouting actually that the multi-user environment, the, uh, whatever the BER performance we are getting sitting in the normal cases, what you are telling, massive MIMO, not giving me the stuff. How you will give? You are releasing your energy in an omnidirectional pattern, everybody is interfering, you, your signal is getting lost. Right? Why are you doing that? You understand the channel properly. It's a special domain sparse. Use the same massive MIMO structure to do the beam forming. That also in an efficient fashion of four dimensional wise, if you think it properly. And then do it in a frequency reuse, special reuse plus frequency reuse pressure pattern. Right? I'm not going into this equation because it's, uh, I just kept to show actually the complicacy coming everywhere. Transmitter side, receiver side, everywhere the angle of departure, angle of arrival. So this is classical example of T minus tau we have seen with the amplitude. Now everywhere actually the delays are coming. Angle domain delays, departure wise, receive wise, and the delay wise. So we came up with some channel models here. It is already published in the public domain. What we tried to do, Professor Rappaport's lab, okay, where Samsung has already funded because, and he is a leading person who first told us about the 60 gigahertz communication in the year of 2009 Globcom conference, and it was a bomb kind of, you will not remember. I was present there. Everybody, starting from Siofi to your Andrea Goldsmith, to everybody shouted on him. What are you talking, Professor? Because it was an open panel. People were telling, failure is dead. Do you remember the paper was also out? Is the failure dead? 2008, 2009, famous paper was there. Because people were claiming, guys, what you have done? You have, after MIMO and WaveDM, you are not doing anything. When you are asking for high spectral efficiency, you are reducing the space. You came up with a femto cell. Tomorrow you will come femto, femto, femto cell, and then you will tell we are increasing spectral efficiency. What is this? I mean, you are increasing the cost of the network deployment, but you are not doing anything. You do something else. So the question was whether file are dead. Globcom 2009, professor answered, let us move to 60 gigahertz. It was a bomb kind of actually. I mean, people started attacking him like anything because 60 gigahertz, we could not do anything even in 3 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz. He was talking about 60 gigahertz. People will be struggling because what will happen to the human health and all that after that transmission as 60 gigahertz happens and all that, fine. And 60 gigahertz distance will be also out. What I will do with the 60 gigahertz? Nobody could visualize today, but just 10 years down the lane, what can come up? He was consistently doing his research with funding from Samsung and he showed that the some good amount of the uh, means uh, communication is possible, even the outdoor as well as the indoor. RMS delay space and the mean delay space, actually he demonstrated. Problem is, if you do research sitting in India, you will never get those high-end RF components to justify actually something else will happen in the field of India. 
and the climate that we are having. Channel model, what he has come up, it's good kind, kind of the climate that he is doing. We all understand that electromagnetic waves property is a function of temperature also. Remember, every molecule is responsive with respect to the change of temperature. So the climate that we see, none of those transceivers will work here. So we have to do our own channel model. Though we are realizing there is no funding. What we can do? What we are good enough. We can do the mathematics. Develop a mathematical model, which will be at part that experimental model. If we can come up with that model, which can give us the RMS delay space and the path loss exponent as well as the min delay, exactly what professor is measuring. So we can at least claim that this is a uniform mathematical model that will help us to develop the transceiver man. I mean, using that mathematical model, I can at least develop my own signal processing because I can go at least to some level of that practical experiment what he is doing. Correct? Thankful to him, he shared with us all the experimental data he did with the New York. It is now open. If you wish to have, you can also get. Okay? So he has put it up. What we came up with is a reflection based models. Remember, wireless behaving like a optics. That concept we have utilized here. This is my transmitter, right? This is our, this guy, he is a reflector. Anybody who is reflecting. Here is my receiver. How will start my model? Actual transmission is going like this. Transmitter has transmitted, something got reflected and receiver has received. Fine. But I am not able to see it, right? What actually happened, if this reflector is a reflector going by optics, I should have an image of my transmitter on the line of sight on the other side. Remember? A small experiment we did in the class 5, 6. I mean, light travels. If you are reflecting something, so it should have an extension at the back. You, that's the way the mirror shows me uh, my uh, image on the other side. So we appeared, I mean, we landed there simply. Fine? After that means, this TXIM is the image of my original transmitter. So now it is a straight line connection between my image transmitter to my receiver. For the time being, if both of them are static, my question problem statement comes down here. For how much region of the shifting of this reflector, I should get my connection. Otherwise, the connection will be out. Clear? So it is given the particular angle of the BOA and AOD. My target is to find the region of the reflection, we did exactly the same. With the help of mathematics, this is the region that we have found shifting it up and down and reflecting it practically on the mathematics, pure mathematics and the stochastic geometry mathematics we did. Believe me, it is a class 10 to class 12 mathematics we did. With a cool brain sitting and bringing everything down and try to realize that look, this is the thing happening and if we can yeah, devise the region, it should work. Third thing actually was the problem that what will happen if there is a building outside. We uh, sent up to these the results to professor. The airport answer asked me that can you actually fix because outdoor this model will have some blockages. So the, let us start with the building blockage. When he asked about the blockage, what we did actually we put uh, the outside the fixed buildings. Then the building is having a problem. He is three dimensional, it's not a 2D. What we did first actually, he told us, okay, fine, you try it with a 2D. So the third dimension we turned off. But actually averaged out over the New York place only, the average length and the width of the buildings we started with, we thought actually all those will be the blockages. But the probability of blockage in the New York, probability of blockage in your Bangalore, and probability of the blockage in Kharagpur are not same. Right? We defined a wide range of the probability of blockage across the city of India possible. And one city we took, New York, because we have to finally value the whole stuff and uh, estimate the whole stuff with respect to his data. Same problem came if I am now in the indoor, apart from the building, human movement will be there. We turned off the third dimension of our stuff. We considered it is a disk kind of. So our dimension like a disk. Okay, and rapid movement is happening. So once we integrated all of them and involved this probability of this blockage, we came up with the RMS drill space that my whole model was giving me, fine. Now see, 
that of course experimental data are the all blue graphs ok. Our analytical results of the RMS delay spreads that we came up with with the red. With this experimental data finally Rappaport came up with a mathematical graph that is the way always we do the approximate RMS delay spread he gave us. Lot of the experiment was done excellent with the 0.1 percent matching we got from the analytical model. This work was published in ICC currently it is on the major revision of TWC. Once it is out at least it I, we prefer that it will give the Indian researchers to work with the signal processing techniques for this. We should not wait for getting a excellent RF equipments do the experiment and then actually we can justify our algorithms otherwise everybody will tell it is theoretically working but practically it is lost right. Uh, some uh, next work towards the millimeter wave beam forming we have understood that we have to do the special beam forming special uh, filtering this is your answer. So beam forming can be done three ways you can do the analog beam forming sitting in the RF. If you do that you have multiple edices on the track if it is a receiver. After that your wet vectors will beam forming means what you are forming the beam and actually directing it when the direction comes definitely you are giving a phase shifting sitting in the RF. So where are you putting those phase shifters is a question. If you put those phase shifters in the digital domain then it is a digital beam forming. If you are doing it in the analog domain then it is an analog beam forming as simple as that. Problem is if you are doing the digital beam forming multiple edices will be there and you are adding at the digital part. But if you are doing the analog beam forming all the phase shifters will be in the analog and then you will be adding it there where the pros and cons multiple edices cost are extensive but signal processing wise beam forming at the digital very easy to do for the signal processing guys. If you wish to save the cost of the ADCs in the receiver go ahead with the analog beam forming but signal processing guys are in big trouble. Analog domain phase control that also 60 gigahertz how to do it. I am coming. So this is the way we can do. Hybrid is this way means understanding that pure analog pure digital is a big problem you separate it out. So for the multiple NT antennas and NR antennas part of those NR antennas will be processed in the analog part of the NR antennas I will be doing in the digital. How this mapping will be done based on my data rate and based on my modulation schemes channel state condition and lot of the stuff that is the ball game of the signal processing people. A hybrid beamforming lot of the worldwide papers are out already and then show that there is a good part that you can do. Another important thing what hybrid beamforming did up is suppose you have 100 number of antennas hybrid beamforming allows uh, you to use a 1 tenth maybe 1 20th a part of those antennas currently active on the stuff clear depends if you use large number of antenna beam will be pencil if you reduce the number of the antennas beam width will be more more beam width means interference chance is higher address it in the signal processing. If your beam width is narrow chances of out of getting out of the communication is large interference handling already is run because of the pencil beam. So if you wish to where do you wish to go interference is the first priority or your cost saving is the first priority. So based on that you choose how much beam width I wish to make is my call. Based on that you divide the existing antenna maybe actually I have connected 100 but if I am not using it by signal processing I am handling it and I am varying the beam width also by selecting increasing or reducing the number of the antennas at the front end. So I am doing basically the scaling on the beam forming right and anyway the power the cost on the RF section also is reduced by that times. It is not the antenna everybody is out. So it is a very big deal from the signal processing side. So this is a total and sometimes people prefer to do the adaptive. So it is not fixed what you are ask, asking if now it is a mobile environment then I have to continuously track that is a beam tracking and if the track is not done I will be coming back and doing it. What I will do 
this is the way I will do. Suppose I have this transmitter and the receivers and I have multiple sectors. First people try to understand like this way. Transmit side, suppose I have two sectors and receive side, I have the smaller beams. So continuously transmission goes on from one by one, one by one, one by one beams. And transmit side, receive side, you try to see in which, from which beam I have done the maximum power received. So I inform that this is the beam number from where I got the maximum receive power. That is the one way both they do. First transmitter transmits receiver search, then receiver transmits transmitter search. That's a very tricky way that uh, they do. And basically forming the beam pattern, we change the wave vectors by the power amplifier uh, gains we change and the phase we change. So there are very static, you open Balani's books. I mean, our old, many ancestors were the classic guys. I mean, they have almost done the job for us, but we didn't realize. Open Balani's book, before 1960s, 50s, he has given all this theory. How to control the weight vectors and the phase shifts if you wish to go ahead with the uniform beam pattern or the variable gain and the shift or you do the both. Variable shift, variable gain. Only these are the pattern that WMK and this phi, that D and lambda, this is the business you are doing. But theory wise, Balanis has already done the research for us. You are varying the array gain factor and the uh, typical patterns. Beam refinement is nothing. After choosing the typical sector, within that sector, if you try to do the refinement over the beams, I mean, basically you are reducing the beam width, then we call it a beam refinement. In 60 gigahertz, they have done all this. I mean, uh, transmit beam forming, then actually beam acquisition was successful, then they have started the communication. The whole protocol is available. If you are interested, you can open up this 1180 specification. Very well explained there. And then if it is tracking after what protocol, which protocol wise, after what time, actually you will keep on doing tracking refinement. And if the refinement is failing, who will indicate you the refinement is failing? Especially from the MAC it comes, and then you initiate. MAC initiates phi to restart the beam forming. These examples, I don't have much time, so I'm just, uh, just going ahead. So major, major problem actually with 1180 beam forming was that when protocol came up in the standard, they thought actually the when the beam will be formed, the front side of the beam will be smooth. It's very hard. No antenna guy can design it, this guy. These days we are doing that design so we know patterns comes like this. I mean non-uniform kind of. So if it is like this, so the choice of the pair, of the beam pair I am saying, when you are doing the beam training, that may get lost the way they initially thought that one one selection, optimal selection we will do. So later on what they decided is don't do that way. You do actually set at least a pair, first pair, second pair, third pair. Every moment, let receiver do the check the decision. If he is not getting that part the QoS, he will actually inform the transmitter and then both transmit receive can try with the second or the third pair. If none of this pair works to give the sufficient SNR or the QoS, do you initiate the beam train for me. That's the simplest thing. So what we try to do is here, we came up with a numerical uh, solution of finding the beams. You will laugh, laugh actually if I tell that from we started. There was a paper called simulated annealing. People applied it, the guys for the boiler designs, you know, for the temperature sensing and the temperature control, the control guys from the electrical engineering, they came up with an algorithm. That was a numerical search mechanism to find the optimum control of the of optimum temperature that can give the minimum energy consumption in the boiler. But the way they were searching it, so I was actually listening this, uh, sitting in a control uh, like this seminar, and some world renowned person came and he was explaining the simulated annealing. The way actually this control and search mechanism works. I came back, we applied the same thing for beam forming. Basically, search mechanism, given the whole SNR pattern of your wireless, how that logic to apply to search the optimal direction 
where the global maximum of the SNR can be found from the channel, as simple as that. Fine. So, the whole uh, stuff will be here only. I do not wish to uh, proceed few slides to show you. This is actually test bed for the MIMO inside the GSNR School of Communication. We have developed the full 4G communication here. It's the actual transmission goes on and we have also calibrated the output results with the standard and it matches. The very recent addition for us for the 5G test bed transceiver. So this PXI chassis, actually for this I got this Qualcomm Innovation Fellowship Award. We implemented the design here and we have shown the transmission and we have developed some new algorithm to handle the front end impairments. But this setup can be also called for any kind of the up to sub 6 giga stuff. And for the RF section, we are, we are coming up with a new RF design section part, and the antenna array and as well as the RF part. This is the 5G test bed for the radio access network. So this project under me was running when with USRP we could form two radio resource heads and one cloud formed in the computer science department, the joint project running. We could transmit and we could show that the good food as per the actual traditional RG, 4G uh, throughput, we can really get with the cloud rank. We change a lot of stuff, protocol wise we change to meet up the throughput, latency also we could achieve. After this one, we got a very big project from the government now to set up this actual distributed radio access network. And uh, this network will implement the concept of the fog, the edge, and the cloud to jointly optimize the, the load balancing, the latency, and integrate the multiple traffic, traffic from vehicular communication, from IoT, from cellular, from the Wi-Fi will be merging and we will be trying to develop all these protocols starting from the protocols to the algorithm schedulers to the routing, testing on the NFV network function virtualization. That's why all the routers here you are seeing, no, they are all the open source. So what you are saying, if you purchase something from the Cisco, it's a black box, you cannot do anything inside it because they will not give you the code. So now this which is, which is a very costly, but it is a open source. So the whole uh, code is with us. We will be rewriting them and changing them out. Sure. I'm sorry, it's a Excellent. very big. Uh, no, thank you a lot. I mean, uh, we should have personally factor for a longer time and more concentrated. Nevertheless, uh, we all enjoy this. Uh, a little bit delay in lunch is not a big deal. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, uh, I, th I think I will not uh, leave you for questions now. She's here and we can catch up with her, right? Thank you.